Hey, welcome back to another HVAC Success Secrets Revealed with Thaddeus and Evan, where we have good conversations with good people, and any good conversation worth having is worth having drunk. Cheers, buddy. Cheers. Enjoying your water? Enjoying the water today, yep. Uh, yeah. yeah, the uh, the old cut on the finger and tetanus shots doing wonders to the downstairs, so... <laughs> We'll just, go. we'll just, we'll just keep her good today. Penicillin will kill everything. It's all uh, good, right? Uh, including, <laughs> anyways. Uh... <laughs> awesome. Well, today we've got a great show lined up. We got Lawrence Castillo. Uh, he is with Brody Pennell down in the LA area, uh, a company that they took over that was seventy-eight years old. And they've been doing tremendous things with it. They've tripled the amount of staff that they've had um, in the, the room and more than tripled the amount of revenue that they brought into the business in just, just under three years. So they're doing an incredible job there. But Lawrence, he was the first ever GM at Service Champions. Uh, he is the only uh, person to run a business for Jim Abrams and Leland Smith and uh, also was the GM at the largest single location service company in Canada when he moved up to Vancouver and helped run the Milani Plumbing and Heating in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Um, a wealth of knowledge. And I know when we were at Profit Rocket in uh, in Austin, Texas, he happened to be coming in the room. He was doing a podcast with another friend of ours, Mandeep and Shreya. And uh, as soon as he came in the room, I was like, we need to get him on the show. And I know you talked to him right then and there and, and got him scheduled up. and. Uh, I'm thrilled to have Lawrence on the show today. I can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be a good episode. I know when when Lawrence and I were chatting briefly in Austin while he was getting ready for um, in the podcast with Born for the Trades, um, you know, had a good conversation about the wealth and knowledge that he's going to bring. Uh, and also a fun fact for those that are fans of Victor Rancourt was also responsible in the hiring of him uh, as well. So kind of a neat one to be able to bring that into the business and uh, the catalyst that's behind that. So uh, it's going to be a nugget filled episode uh, for sure. As we dive deep into a lot of different topics. Absolutely. Can't wait to have a better podcast and board for the trades. And <laughs> would not be possible without our sponsors. Uh, we got Chirp, Real Time 360 and On Purpose Media. Uh, let's go with Chirp first. All right. Well, Chirp, uh, perfect timing, actually, as we're heading into shoulder season for some areas. Obviously, some areas where you're cold as fuck, Canada, um, you're going into furnace season. But with Chirp, how would you like to be able to add in an extra $40,000 in revenue, $42,000, actually, um, within two uh, within one month, or $80,000 in revenue in just 14 days? People have done it, just like Dave and Cassie, um, with their built-in rehash program, among other things, automated text messages, emails, ringless voicemails, direct mail, Google reviews. It goes on and on and on. And guess what? You get 25% off your first three months by going to chirp.com forward slash HSSR. And when you got all those leads coming into the business, you got to make sure that you're tracking everything and then staying on top of it as well. And that's where Real Time 360 comes in. Are you tired of juggling multiple marketing tools, agencies owning all of your logins? Say goodbye to that frustration. Take control of your marketing with Real Time 360. You can streamline all of your reviews when the jobs are completed, automate your social media, and use the plethora of uh, different social media posts that they have on the back end there. Engage your customers with live chat, and more importantly, track all of your success all in one place. Join the revolution. Empower your success with Real Time 360. You can check them out at realtime360.io. Perfect. And if uh, really quickly, if you don't have leads coming in and you don't have the ability to do a rehash program because you had no leads, well, get in touch with us on purposemedia.ca forward slash marketing dash analysis. We'll give you a run through on what's good and what's not uh, on your marketing. So there we go. Uh, without further ado, Patter, let's get at her. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to HVAC Success Secrets Revealed, a show where we interview industry leaders and disruptors, revealing the success secrets to create and unleash the ultimate HVAC business. Now your hosts, Thaddeus and Evan. There we are. Welcome, Lawrence. Thank you. Good to be here. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited yes. to dive in. I am Thanks too. Thanks for taking time, having a drink with some crazy Canadians. Hey, cheers, gentlemen. Cheers. What are you drinking there? Uh, I am uh, H2O. 
<laughs> and I've got some That's Rupert high quality H two O. Sorry, I interrupted you again, Evan. You did. I'm mm -hmm. used to it. Mm -hmm. uh, Rupert's whiskey is what I am drinking today. Not Alberta's best. Not no no Alberta premium here. Okay. <laughs> I was in the liquor store two nights ago, and some guys were buying Alberta premium. And I was just and I had a, a bottle. I was going to drink a bottle today. Uh, well, not the whole bottle, but have a drink of uh, the Forger. And I'm just like, yeah, you guys, this is this is a really good whiskey. And they're like, nah, Alberta premium. I'm like, but you guys have five liters of Coke for a for a two six uh of you know 750 mils a bottle like maybe something's wrong with that picture there boys <laughs> <laughs> you got a volume buying right right yeah uh welcome lawrence thank you so much for taking the time truly appreciate it uh having a drink with some crazy canadians at 11 a.m uh down in la but uh hey it's five o'clock somewhere so it is five o'clock somewhere and this is uh quite all right enjoying it and just happy to be here Absolutely. So why don't you walk us through your journey into the trades? Obviously, we know your history around uh, you know, being the general manager at Service Champions and Milani and, and now running uh, your business today. But how did you get started? What, what was your journey into it? What attracted you to it? Hmm. Um, it was a happenstance. Um, I have a, had a, my best friend some 25 years ago our uh, our children went to school together and he had a little residential company uh he had worked in commercial heating and air conditioning had cashed out and um he went and bought a little residential company and he had never run a company he had you know hadn't hired people hadn't been through those battles and uh but he did this on the advice of ken goodrich right ken was very tight with him and ken said hey the residential game is what you need to be in you're in and out in a day you're not strung out on payment you know like you are in commercial so he did it and um it just it was tough for him he just wasn't he didn't have the the people piece and we got to talking and he wanted me to be his general manager right and i knew nothing about air conditioning and uh, so I showed up on day one as the general manager and, you know, everybody in the whole building knew more than I did. And so I had to humble myself and, you know, read a lot of books and sit next to the CSRs and do ride alongs. And we were a small company. I think we were 13 people. Um, so I just learned it all. I unloaded the trucks in the warehouse because uh, I wanted to learn the parts. Um, I went on installations, you know, went on sales leads, just did the whole thing and ended up learning it pretty quickly. And, um, you know, I, but I learned really quickly that he had all the wrong people, right? So I ended up having to let a lot of those people go and just recruit my own people in. But I think the important piece that I learned out of that, that opportunity was uh, I didn't know much about the sales piece for in heating and air conditioning. So I had a couple of guys come out. I had Charlie Greer come out and I had Carl DeBenny come out and do some sales training with my, my guys. Uh, Charlie Greer was still running calls with people at that time. So I had him running calls with my technicians and just learned a lot um, from, you know, from what he was doing. And I, I really realized that, wow, the, the sales training is something that I think I could do well here. And that's a piece that I've carried with me. Um, you know, all these years, I just, you know, it makes such an impact in your business. And I've never had a sales manager everywhere, anywhere. I've always been the sales manager. So, um, so we, we sold that company and ended up, uh, uh, sold it to a consolidator and I ended up working for Jim Abrams. Um, and I ran one hour heating and air conditioning here in Los Angeles. And, you know, what a, what a godsend, you know, at the time I didn't realize who he really was and, and his importance to, you know, all reputable heating and air conditioning contractors in, you know, North America. And he invented the blueprint that all of us followed and just everything, it, you know, he was, he was the author. So, and I had a chance to directly report to him. Um, my shop, he, you know, there was, they owned a bunch of shops across America, but there were only like 10 or 15 that were corporate owned. So I reported directly to him and, you know, those days were really important in the formation. I just, the gold that would come out of his mouth constantly, just really like it really helped me to, you know, to shape the kind of manager, the kind of, you know, leader that I am. Um, 
And then, you know, I had the good fortune uh, to work at Service Champions and um, as the general manager. Um, and I was there for the formative years and just had a chance to, you know, learn a lot of great stuff. There was so much incredible stuff that when I walked into that building, I never knew existed in heating and air conditioning. They were so much more advanced than the things that I had seen. There was just smart, smart things going on. Um, and then, you know, I, I would like to think that I added um, some stuff um, and put my fingerprints on the business as well. And uh, so that was just, you know, I think the person that I am today, the kind of shop I run today, the, the structure and the process and the procedure, it's the sum of, you know, the stuff that I saw at Service Champions, the stuff that I saw working for Mr. Abrams. Um, I, I would like to think that, you know, my shop is just a real mini version of what Service Champions was when it was, you know, much smaller. Um, but learned great lessons from those folks and just got lucky along the way. And, um, you know, it's different now as an owner, right? When you're the general manager, you learn, you learn stuff and you put it in your back pocket, but it's a different, different perspective when it's, you know, your business. And, um, and then of course, in Canada, I had just an incredible opportunity to run Milani plumbing in Vancouver. And, um, you know, that was a very big shop, um, you know, a few hundred people and, and just a very different experience than running a company here. But, you know, the principles still all apply. You just have to find a different method. Um, and just really enjoyed my time there. And, and so here we are back in Los Angeles. Um, and, you know, we, we purchased our third company today. Um, so we have three brands underneath our umbrella and just finished a meeting with my employees this morning, announcing that the most latest, the, the latest acquisition and uh, excited about the future here. So I'll keep yes. talking. Let me, you got to stop me. <laughs> no, all good. Well, congrats on the third company uh, in landing that deal today um, and having that, uh, that go out and then jumping on a podcast with us. So a good celebratory drink uh, is yes. in order uh, with, with us. So appreciate that. Um, sure. I kind of want to go back right to the very beginning in, you know, uh, coming into a GM with zero experience, right? In the industry, a lot of times you see it the other way around where somebody has experience and then they go into an office or into a leadership role. So knowing what you know now, if you were to, 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 and I think that path that I mentioned is, is more likely than what your path was of coming into, you know, a GM, knowing what you know now about that process, what would you say to somebody who has the experience now going into the GM role or manager role or any type of a leadership role with inside of an organization? I'm about to do it tomorrow. I, I stood in front of 115 people here today and told them that we just bought another company and that starting tomorrow, I'm going to be running that other company, which I'll do for a few months before coming back here. But um, I'm doing that tomorrow. I'm going to show up and do a business that the people have never met me. And there's not a lot of them, you know, there's 25 of them. And that business is a 1961 business, um, legacy business, but it's been run one way forever. The owner is selling it to us and he's retiring. He's in his late seventies and they've only seen what he's shown them. And, you know, he hasn't had the exposure that others have had. And so it's, I have to be careful, right? I have to go in there very humble and very appreciative and respecting the tenure and all of the stuff that um, came before us. I tell this to my my people here all the time, you know, we're this is a 78 year old business that we have and and it's taken years um, of great customer service to get to this, us to this point. And we have to treat every customer so well um, because it took people for many years before us to you know, to acquire these customers, that whole saying about it takes years to acquire a customer and minutes to lose one. We just yep. have to be so great. So these are the lessons that the people, um, you know, at the new company that we purchased that, that we'll be sharing with them. But, um, I think the advice would be for somebody who is experienced, um, is, you know, I, I know what at, at this point in my career, I know what I'm looking for when I walk in the door, I know the places that I need to look to find, the, you know, where the problems are, um, where we have opportunity, uh, to be better. And, but I have a whole learning cycle that I have to go through. Um, but it starts with meeting the people and 
you know, if you get the people to buy in, then anything is possible. But tomorrow I'll be sitting down with all of these people one by one and asking them about their life and, you know, sharing a little bit about mine and we have to earn their trust and we have to work side by side. And it just, it really starts with trust. So that starts tomorrow. No, oh, I love that. Cause it's, yeah. um, that was, that was my next question was when you're coming into a company, how do you retain those people? Because similar to the it's years to, to gain a customer minutes to lose them. It's the exact same with staff. It takes years to gain that trust and that to get that total buy-in into a mission, into a culture of a company. And then to have that transition happen from one owner to another, a lot of times retention gets hit pretty hard with that. So I'm curious when you came in to Brody Penner or Pennell, sorry, um, what was that turnover like when you first came in there? And then what experiences are you taking from that into this new company? Great question. Um, there were 34 employees here when we walked in the door in a business that was doing $7 million and just no change, no growth. And, you know, when you walked in the door, it was apparent why it had just maintained for so long and there was just nothing, nothing really happening. Um, and it was like I just mentioned, because they hadn't been exposed to the amazing stuff that exists in heating and air conditioning outside of the walls of this old business. So you have to earn their trust um, and you have to go slowly. You know, I knew that there was a bunch of stuff that I had to change, but I couldn't tell them that, you know, you, you have to stand up front diplomatically. And but the, re the reality is, is that we kept everybody right. Um, that, that's not a problem. I think that when you show them that there's a better career trajectory for a lot of them, you know, th there were folks here that when we got here, you know, they had just been shuffled around and promises are made that are never kept and there's pay issues and there's, you know, job description issues and there are things that aren't getting done and um, clarification. And, you know, I'm big on accountability and on process and procedure and that stuff didn't exist here. It really didn't. Um, so, you know, it just set the expectations, you know, let them know that you're a reasonable person and that you expect everyone to show their best. And if they do that, there's great things that can happen for them. But if not, we'll provide some coaching. And uh, if that doesn't work, then we'll see what happens after that. But I will tell you that we bought a business in San Diego in June and everybody's still there. Um, you know, they, they have bought in, we've doubled revenue in five months, um, the monthly revenue, and we've added some people. And I'll tell you what, we've added people. And some of these people are, they are victims of some of these, you know, there's so much consolidation going on right now. And in that city, you've seen some of the bigger consolidators come in and buy up the companies. And some of the people that we picked up have come from those companies. And the story is the same with all of them. Um, you know, these, the companies that are buying them, the private equity portfolio, the platforms that are buying them, they're coming in and they're just missing the human piece. It's mm -hmm. more of a business transaction. And with us, like, it's all about the human piece. You know, I, we bought the business in San Diego. I moved my family down there for three and a half months to run it daily so that the people knew that we wanted, that we cared and we wanted, you know, to, 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 to do the right thing. And it's going to be the same thing with this other business starting tomorrow. Um, we're just, we're doing this differently. Right. And, but once again, these are legacy businesses, 1945, 1977, 1961. Um, so the people matter and the customers matter. So, right. Well, in, people, in, don't, in, uh, uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Exactly. Right. Uh -huh. Exactly. Uh -huh. Um, well, and, and I, I mean, this is, it's like me beating a dead horse every time I say this, I think, but people product price, right. And that's how a business should be ran, not price product people. And, right. but people has the two offshoots. It's your employees and it's your customers, right. And your employees, your team members are actually before your customers. Cause if you take care of them, guess what they're going to do for your customers. They're going to take care of your customers. Right. And then the product and the price just fall into place naturally. But you know, one thing that you mentioned is, is, you know, the human piece and, and bringing that coaching first. When you mentioned that you alluded it to in your intro that you've had the wrong people, you had to let a bunch of people go and then you've had to recruit new ones in its place. And I'm sure that that's an ongoing, you, you know, uh, any business that's ongoing, right. Um, for it. And I always think back to saying, okay, well, how do you get them to the right place? And if they can't get to the right place via your coaching, 
when do you know it's time to cut your losses and say bye bye? Or no, as great. somebody in our business likes to go, deuces. Yeah. <laughs> it's another great question. Um, it it you know, you, you can't make those determinations until you really understand the people. But, and this comes from the, the service champions piece. Um, it, it was a business run by the numbers. You know, if you've seen the movie Moneyball, you understand this, that all the decisions that we made in that business were run, were by numbers. And if you have, you know, a hundred and whatever trucks driving around every day, and you let all those folks know, hey, I've provided this opportunity. We've hired you. It's a level playing field. We're going to give you the keys to a truck at your own little store. It has to be profitable. And there are certain metrics that you have to hit. And you're going to be judged against all of your teammates. And, you know, you start to show them where they stand next to the others. And they either pick up the pace and realize that they've got to be better. Um, or they just quietly fade away and, you know, sometimes they'll just remove themselves from the business because they realize that they just, they're not up to the task. So it's really measuring people by the numbers that, that sort of, that helps you to make the decisions, right? It, you know, if, if you're taking a look at people on a monthly basis and they see those numbers and there's transparency, there's nowhere to hide. And, and this is a, Terry, Terry Nicholson had a great quote that we had on the wall at Service Champions in one of the training rooms like some 15, 18 years ago. And it was, and it said something to the effect of, um, you know, the strong, um, something about the, you can't hide behind, the, you know, the numbers just tell the whole story and there's nowhere to hide. Um, and so I try to operate by those same principles here. You know, if, if you're an underachiever, everybody's going to know about it. And it's, it's an embarrassing thing, right? To be on the bottom of the leaderboard and, you know, it's uh, you have to make those. Sometimes they end up helping you to make that decision because they just can't get it fixed. But I would like to think that we give people all the opportunity and that we're, you know, we look at these numbers and we recognize when somebody's, you know, failing. Um, I would like to think that we, you know, we we try to train them up and help them. Oh, I right. love that. And I mean, yeah. the data tells a story, right? And that's it it's something that I talk about with our team when we're looking at data analytics when it comes to a marketing side of things. Um, it, it's telling a story. It's up to us to decipher what that story is. Um, I'm curious as the operator, though, when we're dealing with people, there's so many intangible things that numbers can start to paint a picture, but it's up to us to uncover what those intangibles are that could be impacting this. How is it that you go about trying to uncover those in conversations with those team members to, to see what it is that could be outside of just pure product knowledge or uh, procedural knowledge that could be impacting what those numbers are doing. Two things. I think it starts with you have to really be involved in your business and have these day-to-day -day conversations. There's a lot of operators that they're checked out. They want to be at home. They want to be on the golf course. They want to travel. And I, I really think that a lot of the success of any business that I've ever been involved in has, or, or any success that I've had in this industry has be, been because I've been boots on the ground with my people, right? I still stand in front of them and train technicians. Um, I meet with people in my office. I do all the hiring and the people might think this is crazy, but we have three locations and I do 100% of the hiring. And it's not that I, you know, think that I am better at it than anybody else, but I just, I like to know who's going to work for me. Um, I like to know the kind of person they are and how they're going to represent us in the field. Um, so I still control that process. Um, but I think number one is to certainly be involved with people, have conversations daily. Um, my office door is open and people come in all day long and sit down and chat with me about everything. Um, th the other part of that is you were talking about, you know, um, finding out the intangibles. I think you have to have a certain level of tolerance, um, and that's tough for some, but, you know, I have some technicians here who they don't bring a ton of revenue in, but they bring a ton of five-star reviews. They make customers happy. Their trucks aren't the most profitable, um, but there's a place for people like that, right? Like we, we have to run the calls and we have to make people happy. And not every call is going to be a $25,000 system replacement, right? Or a $3,800, you know, repair ticket. 
it's okay if we go out and we come back with, you know, the diagnostic fee sometimes, but if we've made somebody happy and they want to share that with somebody and share it with the world, um, there's some trade off there. So I try to, you know, I look at the numbers and, and the review numbers are a part of it, right? And the service agreement sales are a part of it. I have some guys who sell a ton of service agreements and they don't do much else, but man, if you're creating work like that, there's, there's a place in the business for you. Right. And it's it. almost like you don't, I you know a lot of people say revenue is uh, vanity and profit is sanity. And, and that's, you know, kind of almost taking a look at this and saying, okay, well, you know, it's not just about, okay, this truck should be bringing in 400000 $500,000 per revenue. It's what is the offshoots from that, right? What's the bigger picture? Like you said, it takes years to win and minutes to lose. You know, I always think of one off shit wipes out a thousand attaboys. You know, my dad told me that when I was young and it's remembered in my brain, right? Um, for it. And so, but if you have those people that are doing that good, that's, that's a, you know, a phenomenal thing. So I guess in terms of recruiting, getting into that part of things and bringing people into the business, or maybe we should pause and do the random question before we get to recruiting. Let's No, you want to go right into recruiting? Ask this question first. Okay. I had the same question written down or on okay. hiring. So. Okay. Right. Um, well, maybe it might not be the same question, but same wavelength uh, that we're going down. So when you look at recruiting and you're looking at bringing people in and doing it all, um, you know, are, I guess that, how many stages of interviews do you guys have? Let's let's start there because if you're doing it all for three locations at the biggest size of the business, I mean, like I still do a lot. I do all of our, the majority of our recruiting, um, you know, it, it's obviously the finals. I mean, there's a lot of steps to get into my calendar on our business. Um, how does it work in there? You know, is there somebody pre-screening and pre-vetting before they even get to you and your calendar? Sure. Um, I arrived here two and three quarter years ago and there were 34 employees and, you know, I had a recruiting plan and the first step was to hire a full-time recruiter in-house. So I found somebody that worked for the gas company here and, and she had been recruiting technicians for the gas company, which is not that far off of what we do. And um, she's really helped this process. Like she's been great, just fills my calendar with people. I do Zoom interviews, I do in-person interviews. Jim Abrams said, as a general manager, 33% of your job is recruiting, right? And that's always stuck with me. And I live by that. And I have, you know, there's no way that we could have gone from 34 to 100 and whatever, 112 people um, in two and a half years here without it being a high priority. It's the same thing for the other businesses that we own. Um, I want to grow them just like this place. And it, it, so it's just constant seeing people. Um, I'm sorry. Get, uh, can you restate that one? Because I. Yeah. I, I well, like, a... how does the, the, yeah, it's all good. It's all good. I, if I can remember it, sometimes I, uh, I just go off on a tangent and uh, it's this, I kind of have, I have the <laughs> end result in mind, but I never really think of my questions through until I start running in my mouth. Uh, okay. <laughs> gets me into trouble. Basically all the time it, was, it was around the hiring process. Like what yeah, does yeah, the yeah. whole hiring oh, yeah. kind of look like? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's not, it's not as involved as you think it is. She sketch, she, she pre-screens them and she knows at this point what I like as far as, you know, a technician or a customer service rep and she'll bring them in if they pass her snuff and they'll sit here in front of me. And honestly, guys, I know within a couple of minutes, if this is somebody that, you know, it's their communication skills, it's their, it's what time they showed up. If you're one minute late to an interview, I will never hire you. I don't care who you are. I will never, because it speaks everything about you, Right. If you can't make it to an interview on time, if you come in dressed haphazardly, if you, I had a kid come in here with all kinds of jewelry the other day, you know, earrings and he had, and it's just like, you're trying to show your best, right? So I'm able to pretty quickly sum up whether it's somebody that's going to help us in the business or not. And um, sometimes I'll hire them right on the spot, walk them down to, to her office. And sometimes I'll send them away wondering a little bit, but know that, know that I'm going to hire them. Um, and sometimes they just, I know that it's a no. Um, so the process is me. It's not, uh, and I can tell you at service champions, it was, it was long and it was a long process, you know, Victor Rancor. Well, he had to go through a gauntlet, right. To get hired. And anybody that goes through service champions, it's, it's a group interview with 70 people. And then it's, you know, a mini interview after that with six people. And then you come back the next day and it's a whole thing, right? Um, but they also did $101 million last year in revenue, right? It's a big operation. And, um, but even when we were 25 million over there, it was still this arduous process, right? It was, 
it was probably a bit much, too many people involved. Um, so, I, you know, here I can get it done quickly and simply, and it's worked for me. It takes up a lot of my day, but, um, you know, here we are and we've grown quite a bit and, uh, I can't say I'm going to complain about the results. So absolutely, I was going to say, how did, how, did, how did Victor even pass an interview uh, screening? I'm surprised he even <laughs> made it through. Uh, <laughs> oh, I love you, Victor. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, we can we can talk about Victor. He's you know <laughs> I, I I I love Victor. I love all the the folks that have worked for me in the past. You know, and I try to support them, and I try to um, if they need me to you know be there for advice, and you know just a lot of really great people that, that were important, um, in my career, but Victor, you know, tall, booming voice, um, competent. Um, and you know, he separated himself in our training classes pretty quickly. You knew he was going to be an achiever and, um, you know, here we are all these years later and he has, you know, he's, people know his name. Like mm -hmm. his name in our industry is household. Like you, you haven't said his last name. We all know who you're talking about, right? Like he's achieved that status. Mm -hmm. He's got plenty of haters um, as many of us probably do. Right. Um, but what he's done to build his own brand is admirable. You know, people have, people have stuff to say about everybody. Ishmael, people have stuff bad to say about this guy, but the fact of the matter is, is that, I'm still working and that guy is enjoying his life, right? Like, how can you criticize that? He mm -hmm. figured it out and he got it done. And so, you know, cheers to Victor. Um, I just, you know, had a chance to speak at his event and um, very graciously, he, you know, we were doing this podcast on stage in front of all the people. And he just, you know, he said, Hey, this is the guy that originally hired me into air conditioning. And that was a nice moment. I thought that was, you know, that was a really cool thing. Um, but he's, you know, I just try to support anything that he does. Yeah. He, uh, I mean, he's, 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 uh, the thing is, is when you, when you be loud, when you be vocal, especially on today's day and age with social media, people are gonna, you get to tar you put a target on your back by doing it. And it's not by any intents and purposes, purposes of him doing that. It's just, it's just the reality of it. Same thing with Victor, right. Uh, or Ishmael rather. And so he's, he's loud, which is completely fine just people end up going after that because they want that success and that's how they cut people down because it makes them feel better about themselves. So, um, well, one quick question what, around the hiring. Do you mind if I, are you still on hiring? Yeah. I still have, I'm mine. Mine was what's his favorite interview question. Oh, that's what I was going to ask you. I was uh, okay. any obscure interview questions or anything that you do to try and weed those people out, um, who may not be the right person and the right fit. Um, it depends upon the position, of course, right? Um, if we're talking about, I, I'm not in here trying to st stump people, really. I, I just ask them about their life. You know, what do they have on their outside life that could possibly impact our business? Um, that it's all about representing our brand. And if they're a customer service agent, they have to be an amazing first touch. If they're a service technician, they have to uh, live up to the bar that we've you know, the level that we've established. Um, if they're a salesperson that there are metrics that they have to hit and if they can't hit it, they're probably going to be replaced. Um, not a favorite question I would say, but, um, I just try to, you know, fill my way through each interview and see exactly, you know, which way I can go with them. So I'm not the, yeah, some people have a standard, uh, punch list and I, I don't know that I operate by that one. So. Well, yeah, a lot of times in, in, in the interviews, like when you like you have the punch list, but if it's also building on the conversation too, right? Um, to to see and asking and going off the script because if you just sit there and answer, ask all your questions, well, what's the point of that? It's not a conversation, right? Is there, there is one thing. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, is there anything you do differently for the different positions? Like I know when I was hiring salespeople, uh, I automatically turned everyone away because you get a lot of no's in sales. So I wanted to see who would push back against that and see what they would, if they would fight for it or if they would just say, okay, thanks anyways, and leave. You know, they've come through what I know, right? Um, it's been relationships. It hasn't been somebody walking in cold off the street. So I really, 
yeah, the, the salespeople that I have, it, it, we haven't had to go down that road. But I, I will tell you this, every single person that comes in here and interviews, I look them in the eyes and they say to work here, you have to pass a drug test and a background check. And if they're driving a vehicle, they have to be insurable. And I look them in the eyes and I ask them, can you pass those two? And they all tell me yes. And many times they can't pass one or both. Um, and, you know, that, that tells me everything about a person's integrity, right? Are they going to lie to you? Their first meeting, right? Um, so, you know, that's a bit of a test. But I operate my business the way that I learned from the other smart people that I worked for, which I try to hire people um, that my customers want in their home, right? Try to think of it in the terms of my grandparents, which tell you what, we have an 80 year old business here and my clientele, they are not young. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, so I talk with everybody about that. We operate by the same principles that many of the other larger companies do piercings, tattoos, all of that stuff. You know, I, I cast no judgment, but our customers do. Right. And if you're 80 years old and you live in Beverly Hills and you see somebody with a sleeve of tattoos and a beard down to here, they're afraid to answer, to open the door because they think they're going to get knocked over the head. And in today's world, the judgment is even worse, right? It's even more significant. So we want them to have every opportunity to have success in the home. And, um, you know, so if they have tattoos, we cover them up, right? And they're, they're not going to wear piercings when they're working. And although I, we just don't have a problem with that, that's not, that doesn't describe anybody that works for us, but, um, and a clean appearance, right? You know, we're not the Yankees, right? At service champions, we had to shave every day. And, uh, but uh, I don't require that here. Um, and, but yeah, we, we try to, we try to run a clean shop here. Yep. Well, and, and for facial hair, there's a difference between a scraggly beard or one that's well-kept and well, and well-trimmed, right? And you have a well-kept and well-trimmed beard. It does look professional, in my opinion, but my opinion is a little bit biased because I have a beard myself. So, <laughs> so think about this. I, I left service champions and came to Canada. Right. And I, I don't know what year was I left service champions, 2015, 2016, something like that. And, uh, you know, up until the day that I left, you, you shave every day, everybody, every manager, every technician, everybody does. And I get to Vancouver and like, everybody's <laughs> just got these huge beards and like, what is going on here? And, um, but you know, it's just a different place and a different experience. And I was like, no, let's, let's do this. So I went ahead and I, you know, I grew out my facial hair and was enjoying it. And ever since then, I've never required anybody to ever shave, you know, um, I don't have a problem with it. I know that they, they still do it over at service champs and you know, that's their prerogative, but, uh, I don't think it's ever inhibited anybody from uh, getting a five-star review or being able to install a blower motor or or uh, any of that stuff. So, well, I mean, up in Canada, you got to keep your face and neck warm. So it, it makes this is sense. true. It's true. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, it is. Thing. It is a thing. I sometimes it's longer in the winter, and you come in and there's icicles hanging off your beard. It's great. Uh, <laughs> so uh, before we get into that in question, Jenner, I always love this question. And when I run our interviews, is describe yourself in the third person. It's literally the first question that I ask them uh, <laughs> because it makes them think, right? It's not designed to trip them up. It's just designed to say, okay, can you think on your feet? And if you can think on your feet, now you can obviously handle, you can look at different things like on the marketing side of things, right? Is, okay, well, can you put your, do you have your blinders on when you do things? Or can you think on your feet and look unilaterally at something that might, might something else might need to get fixed? So, um, and done. that's why I like that question. Plus, I just think it's funny watching people's facial reactions when I ask it. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I think that people would say he's no nonsense to a point. Um, he's very organized. He knows exactly what he wants. He, he expects results. Um, he, he has been there and has seen success and knows what it looks like. And the things that he asks us to do is because he knows that if we follow that path, that we will have success. Um, he's direct and, but he's not unrealistic and he's not without compassion. Um, he's a great boss and 
he likes for his people to be happy, more happy than they've been any working anywhere else. Um, and that's probably, you know, more or less what I think they would say. <laughs> Nailed it. You're hired. Can you start Monday? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I love how I love how I didn't even think that yeah like I just I just said it is one of my favorite things and you just go in and you answer the question so I appreciate you doing that uh, oh, it's it's okay. a lot more difficult than you think somebody asked mm -hmm. flipped it on to me once in an interview I'm like oh that's tough uh, but I answered it so um, all right let's get into the random question uh, and then Evan you have it after that so uh, random question generator brought to you by On Purpose Media if your organic reach is shorter than a T Rex's arms let us extend your grasp. Uh, that is funny. We'll go, 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 go gadget those arms for you. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's a go, go gadget. Point. Not everybody yeah. understands that, right? <laughs> no, 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 that's, yeah. There's a, there's a generation that doesn't understand what you're talking about here. So. No, no, definitely not. I used to come back from delivering the papers and watch uh, Inspector Gadget all the time. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So we read off Well, you get to choose. I have three questions on here. One, two, or three. Uh, and you don't get to know what they are beforehand. You just get to choose what question you want me to ask you. Do you want question one, two, or three? Number two. Number two. Uh, all right. What is the weirdest smell that you enjoy? Um, I smoke a lot of cigars. I enjoy the smell of a cigar, but I don't know that that's weird. Um, I think that... Um, Hmm. You know, there's that whole thing about the smell of gasoline, mm. right? There are, you know, I don't mind the smell of gas, right? Um, and when you're a kid, you know, you're cutting grass and you're, you know, you always, you're, you know, so I don't mind the smell of gas. I'm not sniffing it or anything, but I don't, I don't mind it. <laughs> um, the weirdest Are smell. It like hoofing gas? Is that what Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, huffing. Huffing. Huffing, that's what it is. Huffing, not hoofing. Huffing. Um, or in, in Canada, it might be hoofing, right? Maybe. I'll let Ooh, you know. Boot it. I don't know hey. if you caught it earlier, but Thad threw out in a boot. Yeah, he did. <laughs> I did, I did I? not. <laughs> I'm used to it. My wife is Canadian, so I get the, uh, you know, the occasional, uh, you know, decal yeah. and semi and uh, the stuff that, you know, we look like we do the double take here in America. Um, we're yeah. always having those conversations, right? Yeah. Um, or her spelling, putting random U's in places. It's uh, I got used to it when I was up there, right? Like there it go. was, it was the washroom when I was up there and I come back down here and you know, the washroom, everybody's like, what, what do you, what's the washroom? <laughs> right. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know what weird smell. Um, I don't know. Well, I'll just I stick with gasoline. I think that's that's. Let me just that's stick with gas, common, right? right? Like I, let's, let's yeah, stick with yeah gas. it's it's I. As soon as you said it, I was envisioning back to my youth when I worked at a gas station. So uh, there you go. Uh, but perfect segue. So Evan, unless you want to go in a different direction, but you talked about you know your wife is Canadian and the nuances between Canada and the U.S. Um, and obviously just nuances in different markets. And so um, some people say, "Well, my market's different." Well, they have a point to an extent. What do you see in terms of having now, you know, been in LA, then up in, up into Vancouver, now back down into the area in terms of nuances? A couple of things. I think that that running a big company in Canada made me so much better as a manager. Uh, thank you, Vern Milani, uh, wherever you are, for affording me the opportunity to run your business when only you and your father had run it before. Um, I, I learned a lot there and, you know, I was the only American in a, in a company with, you know, a couple hundred people. And I, I learned, you know, I went up there with, he hired me mostly because of my service champions experience, right? He was looking to make a move and to grow his business and he knew the lineage that I came from. And so he brought me on board and, you know, I, I get up there and I realize, whoa, this is, this is a lot different, right? Here in America, I'm recruiting kids off the street and putting them behind the wheel of a of a vehicle after 12 weeks to go do heating tune-ups. And I get to Canada and it's like, wait a minute, you have to have a gas ticket. I'm like, what's a gas ticket? And they're like, well, it's like a couple of years of, of school. And I'm like, well, there goes my there goes my plan to grow the business. Um, 
And, and then I look around at, at, you know, the, the, you know, all of my employees and, um, you know, I had people from everywhere in the world and, you know, part of what I'm able to do when I grow and, and, and build and drive revenue is to, to sales train. And when you're sitting in front of 25 people from Scotland, England, Iraq, India, China, and, 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 you know, there's a, there's a cultural difference. There's um, a customer service difference. There's so much, so many things different that you have to try to find a way to find a common, you know, a, a, a way to reach all of them. And I think it made me better um, as a communicator, better as a, as a leader. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's a different animal up there. And um, so we, and we had success. We had success. What a, what a, what a great business and um, thankful for the opportunity and learned so much. And, um, you know, it set me up to come back here and to, you know, to, to put me in this seat where, you know, like I said, we're growing our portfolio, but um, so recruiting is different in Canada. Um, I think that uh, pricing structures are different in Canada. I think that management is different in Canada. The way that you, you know, like service champions, we were, we were rough. We were, we were tough on people and the general nature of the people that were working for us um, in Canada were, you know, once again, you have to recognize their background and where they come from and be sensitive to that. It's just, it's a very different scenario, but I would like to think that we had incredible success. And, you know, when I was there, we built a training room and we established, there was just a lot of change that we made to the business and, um, but yeah, completely different. Um, but so thankful for the opportunity. And honestly, at the end of the day, um, if this all went away tomorrow, um, I could go to Canada and just, I think, do something really special um, somewhere. Uh, really enjoyed the time there. And of course, it's, you know, my my wife is from there. My my little kiddos are, are birthright citizens. And um, so it, you know, it means something to us and, you know, special place in our heart. So. No, well, and, and now it actually, it, it makes a lot of sense in terms of when you say, and, and I think it's a, a big thing, you, you know, just a lot of times in management to get carried away with the, you know, this is our way, we're rough. But, you know, when I think back to what was a grade seven social studies, cultural mosaic versus a melting pot, right? And when you look at the difference in, in terms of the actual culture in the, the countries, you know, very much more on the cultural mosaic up in Canada, we're very much more the melting pot down in the U.S., but looking at now the human side of what you bring to this business, it makes a ton more sense because now you're more of a cultural mosaic with inside of your business. So if you were to extrapolate that experience to tell somebody how to be more cultural mosaic in their business, what would you say to them? I don't, I don't know that everybody has that piece, right? I think, um, you know, either you do or you don't. And You know, I, I know my personality befits a situation like that. You walk into a, a place and there's a bunch of people that don't look like you. Um, and you have to try to make them better and lead them down a path. And you have to get them behind you and to believe in you and to understand the changes that you're trying to make. And um, so I, I think with regard to your question, I think it it's... I think I had to be really tolerant. Um, and I, there were, there were things that, you know, like I said, at service champions, we were pretty rough on people um, at that time. And you get to Canada and you just sort of have to sit back and say, you know, I can't be that way here. Right. I can't be the person that I was. And I think that I, I'd become much more tolerant. I think I'd become um, a little more sensitive to what, the employees need and want because of that experience in Canada. Um, I think I've become the kinder, gentler version of myself, I guess. Um, and, you know, things are, and you guys hear this all the time, probably from Americans, but, you know, oh, Canadians are so nice. They're so, but it's true. Like the experience of being up there, like 
it's, it's you know los angeles like this is a scary place this is a scary place it's um it's not that way in vancouver at least um or calgary um, uh, east, fan. Fan. east fan uh, unless <laughs> the hockey team doesn't win in the stanley cup finals then <laughs> all hell breaks loose and cop cars are flipped and burned so or or well, just an east fan all the time well <laughs> w- when it comes to stanley cup finals you know neither vancouver nor calgary um have any recent experience with that right so <laughs> yeah, that is edmonton and i'm an oilers fan so yes uh, <laughs> yeah. although although they've they've uh you know they've made a little noise the last couple of years right mm-hmm. the oilers mm-hmm. have and and so have the flames for that matter right it's uh we watch intently right last year's last year's stanley cup playoffs we were we watched everything from every team it's just uh you know i had a rooting interest because i'm from colorado and uh i was a avalanche season ticket holder from you know year number one and uh my wife is a of course you know flames fan and um so no we had last year's playoffs were really really fun so yep. um, the quebec nordiques in colorado avalanche uh, that's right that's right <laughs> patrick, Wall. I was a patrick yeah <laughs> uh, i was a patrick wall fan so i uh, i i feel you when uh, when he came down there and won the cup so yeah, he's yeah. he's he's one of the biggest sports heroes in in Denver's history, right? Yeah. Like he's right there with John Elway, Patrick Waugh, um, just you know he gave us something that was really Ray Bork, right? And all those guys, you know, there were just so They're, many amazing the, players. Those teams were so good, mm-hmm. so good. Yeah, Forsberg, Sackick, Rob Blake, oh, just and and a lot of people that passed through there that that you never. Theo Fleury played there for a cup of coffee. Oh. Paul Correa played there for a cup of coffee. There were a lot of guys that made it through, made it through there. But well, guy, that was where you went at, towards the end of your career to try and win a cup. That's, that's why true. Ray went. That's why Rob went. Right? Like, mm-hmm. I've I've had people ask me over the years, "What's your favorite sports moment?" Right? And when we won the Super Bowl, Elway, you know, we had waited a long time for that. We had a lot of heartbreak, but but the year that Ray Bork, that year that we won the cup, um, like. We all cried, grown men. We cried, you know, and I um, took my daughter to see the Stanley Cup that year. They had a photo op and, you know, I put her up there and she hugged the cup and I didn't touch it. And, you know, a lot of people were kissing it. And I just, I, this is what I thought. I was like, who am I to kiss the cup before Ray Bork has an opportunity to do that? So that was my piece of, you know, of respecting what was happening and, Anyway, Patrick Waugh stood on his head that whole playoffs and they just rallied and it was just a very magical thing. So very special. What is it? What is it that you feel like touches or pulls on someone's heartstrings when they see one of their heroes achieve something like that, or they see a performance that they, they have no actual connection to this person. They've never met them in real life. They've seen them on a screen. And yet it moves them emotionally. What is it that you think triggers that? Human nature. You know, I mean, you, we, Ray Bork gets traded to the abs late in his career and everybody knows it's for a cup run. And when you start to see magic happen and when you start to see the guys, the sacrifices that they're making to try to make this happen. And then, and then you win the cup and they hand it to Sackick and Sackick doesn't raise it. And he skates over and he gives it to Bork. I mean, come on. Like there wasn't a dry, dry eye in all of Denver. It's what a special thing, right? I saved all my tickets. In Boston that, that watched him. It's, it's so out. true. Like, so true. Yeah. Talk about deserving. And it doesn't, you know, what a fairy tale ending. Not everybody gets a fairy tale ending, but when you see one, like what a, what an amazing thing to happen. So mm-hmm. well, a lot of people in sports chase that fairy tale ending near the end of their career. If they've been with yep. an organ, if they have a twenty-year career, let's say, and and you know they've been with one organization for fifteen years, the well, last five years they tri- they chase, they chase, they chase, they chase. They don't ever get it, yep. right? It's true. Well, and I think for a lot of people, it's chasing something that they either didn't take advantage of themselves, and they see a lack in themselves that in in seeing this other person achieve that. They're seeing that missing component from themselves. Very true. So true. It's, and you see it not just in hockey or, or sports, yeah. but you see it in life, yep. right? 
And, um, you know, I, not everybody has the good fortune to be in the position to, you know, have a crowning achievement, right? Mm. Um, hey, I'm, I'm sitting here and what I'm trying to make my crowning achievement, right? Like this is the exclamation point for me and I'm working, working as fast as I can to make this happen. And, uh, you know, I think when I'm able to look back, I think what we've got here is really special. People are talking about it. I'm getting interviewed about it. You know, people call every day to try to buy this business. Um, and, you know, that's not the plan. Like we're here building something. And I look forward to reading this chapter down the road, you know. Love it. Um, something that I find really fascinating about your journey is that you've worked primarily in markets where there's very little demand in terms of weather. Um, obviously, on the plumbing side, that's always going to be there no matter what market you're in. But you know, even in Vancouver, you're not dealing with the massive sub-zero temperatures like we get in Alberta. I will get we'll dip down to minus 40 Fahrenheit, and it's it's cold as fuck. There's a lot of demand then. Yeah. Vancouver, you don't get that. LA, you definitely don't get that. And you also rarely get the 100 degree days. So how is it that you've had to train your sales staff differently to help generate that demand and create that demand? And from a marketing perspective, what have you done to create demand? Thank you for asking that question while I refresh my drink here. So um, I've already made my way through the first one that I poured. So um, like you have I have a fridge underneath your desk that had no, ice in it. Got, <laughs> the old malt cask. Um, this is a it's a it's a good it's a good bottle. I didn't realize it was as good as it was until my wife pulled it out last night and she's like, Oh, this is a this is a really nice bottle. So um only the best for you guys though. Cheers, Cheers for appreciate her. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Appreciate her. Um And like that, it's gone. <laughs> uh, demand, uh, working pride. Oh, the demand. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for asking that question. Yeah, thank you for asking the question. <sighs> Delicate subject. Um, in Los Angeles, our salespeople are better than the people in other markets um, mm -hmm. that have demand. Uh, I'm from Colorado. And in Colorado in the winter, it is, and this is Fahrenheit, it's in the 30s and the 20s, and mm -hmm. it is snow and ice. And in the summertime, Fahrenheit, it's in the 90s most of the summer. So you have a robust heating and a robust cooling market. Um, there are other markets that are very, very hot, and it's the demand is there. Um, in Los Angeles, it's, it is, you have to create the urgency yourself because weather doesn't create it for you. Today in Los Angeles, if you could see the sky here, um, it is overcast and it is 65 degrees today. Um, no furnaces are breaking down when it's 65 degrees and no air conditioners are being used. Yet, you know, my company put up, I don't know, $220,000, $230,000 in sales yesterday. Um, and we did that because I have a sales team that goes out, gives a great customer service experience, educates the customer, gets them involved, makes it an amazing experience. And we have 78 years of history. We have 2,000 five-star Google reviews behind us, nice wrapped trucks, amazing website, uh, Los Angeles Times best of the Southland um, designation that's voted on by the readers of the LA times. We have all that momentum behind us that helps, but still as a salesperson, you have to be able to walk into a house and create incredible urgency to walk out with 20 or $30,000. It's magic. It's magic. And it happens all day, every day here. I have a great team. Um, and you know, they're, they're out there making it happen. So the difference is, yes, we have to be better. We have to be better because right now on the East Coast or wherever, you know, Toronto, I don't know, whatever, wherever there is severe weather, it's it's a little easier for somebody who's running leads or running calls there than it is for my guys today. Yet they're going to come through because they're special, you know? I love that. Um, 
you know, you did mention in that piece, the 78 year old company that you're running now, again, you just bought another company that's, I think you said 60 years old as well. Um, you've been very intentional about the types of companies that you're looking to acquire for other guys that are looking at M&A as an option. Um, why, what, what goes into your process of discernment when you're looking at a company and whether or not you wish to add them to your portfolio? Great question. There are platforms that own 25 businesses right now, right? Um, and they are adding them left and right. And if you're a platform that exists in Florida and you're buying businesses in California, and I'm seeing it happen. I've like I've got there's one platform that they're from not from here, and they're just hiring people to run it in their stead. And these are people that don't know about the culture, about the city, about the people, about the market. They're just plugging people in. Um, like we're buying companies, we live here. We're buying companies with a great history and a great brand story and great heritage. And I'm showing up and I'm spending three months getting it together. And then I'm finding a great qualified manager to leave in my stead. And, you know, they're, they're running it um, as we see fit because we have a great recipe for success here. But, you know, we're just, w the human side of it is, is more important for us. We own three businesses. That's it. And, you know, I'm centralizing some of the accounting and some of the call center operations here People are coming for training from San Diego to this shop. I'm sending people here from LA to San Diego to help train down there. It'll be the same thing with our San Fernando Valley business. Um, it's just, this is really not about, we're not trying to build a platform of, or a, a portfolio of businesses that to say, Hey, we've got seven air conditioning companies. No, we're buying great businesses and just trying to make them better. And, and, not just growing the businesses, but making things better for everybody that works there, giving them a different experience than what they've had before. Um, and to let them see the inside of this place, like what's going on here is really special. And, you know, they travel up from San Diego, they're here and they're like, wow, like this is what can really happen, you know? Um, and they go back there, recharge, ready to go. And, and they're a believer in what we're doing. So um, very exciting times and just, you know, excited to show up to business number three tomorrow morning. Love it. So Love not it. the not the mass buy approach, but more strategic. And you know, if you buy a fourth, you buy a four. It sounds like if you buy a fourth, you buy a fourth. But if you don't, you're you're content and happy with three. One hundred percent. We're not buying to buy. We're not looking for anybody who's selling their business. There's been people that we've talked to that just it's not a good fit. But um, you know. The, the people that we bought businesses from so far are people who owned them for a really long time. Uh, well, I mean, let's talk about the one in San Diego. They had two other large groups that they met with and they met with us and they chose us and they've maintained this entire time and they've spoken about it, that they chose us because they knew that we were going to take care of their customers and their employees. All their employees are still with us. Uh, we've lost no customers. Uh, there have been pay increases for most everybody that, that work in the building. Um, you know, it's just, we're, we're just showing them things that they haven't seen before to help grow it. And, um, so that's, that's well, the plan. Key, key just, yeah. Key factor for somebody that wants to sell their business guys, what he just said, looking to take care of their employees and their customers, right? Remember years to win minutes to lose your customers and your people, right? So when you're selling your business too, keep that in mind when you're asking those questions. Like, hey, what's your plan to take care of my existing employees and my existing customers? I mean, unless you don't care about that, then whatever, sell to whoever. But I deep down, I think most people do. The one that we just finished the purchase of and that I'll be at tomorrow, um, he's been in business since 1961. And I've known him. And I picked up the phone a year ago to call him and it wasn't the time. He just, he wasn't ready. He called back, you know, a few months later and he, he was ready and we've done the deal. But, and he told me this two days ago or three days ago, he said, Lawrence, the reason that I chose you guys is because I know that you're going to take care of our people. Um, his name is well known in this town and he has a, you know, his, it was his dad's company, right? His dad started it. 
And, you know, there's a legacy there and it's important to people. Can you imagine spending your whole life in a building and then walking away? Like you want to feel good about walking away and you want to feel good about the people that you're handing the keys to that, you know, that it's not going to be a bloodbath and that everyone's going to have more opportunity and that there's going to be more capital that we can invest in the business to grow it. That's exactly what we're doing. There's the full transparency. We're just, we're hundred percent doing the right thing. And we're being very picky about the businesses that we're buying. Fantastic. No, it's, I, I love the model. I think it's fantastic. Um, and again, it, it, when you remove that desperation piece from it, uh, it becomes very clear and, and you're able to make a, a clear decision based off of parameters that you've set out, uh, which as we alluded to before the show, I think it's brilliant, your strategy. And um, especially as we move into this generative search type market that we're going to be moving into with Google as they continue to test with AI and all of these different aspects. When you've got a business where people are searching out a name versus a service, then uh, you own that market and you own that customer. So it's incredibly impactful. Um, Lawrence, thank you so much for coming on. Truly appreciate it. You've added a ton of value. I know we're going to get a ton of snippets out of this episode and be able to make some, uh, some fun little short content as well. Want to make sure that we hit on all of the ways that people can get in contact with you. Um, so of course go check out the website. He said it was fantastic. So now you can hold him to it and go audit it. Uh, BrodyPanel.com. <laughs> I did take a quick look. It actually does look pretty, pretty decent on the eye test. There you go. Thank you. My opinion. Opinion. Thank you. <laughs> you can reach out to Lawrence on LinkedIn as well. Uh, we'll just put that link down below. Uh, we've got facebook.com slash Brody panel, and you can check them out on YouTube as well. Brody panel, Los Angeles, go check them out on there as well. Lawrence, we got one final question for you today, my friend. Uh, it's one of our favorites. And that is one, what is one question that you wished people would ask you more, but they don't? Probably what's your why? And, and I hear, and I hear people ask this, but nobody asks me this. Nobody's ever asked me that. Um, okay, well, what's your why? I'm not concerned about a legacy, right? I'm not concerned about, although, you know, from the outside looking in, you might see that I've done 10 or 11 podcasts and, you know, I've spoken at a bunch of events and stuff. And it's like, I'm like, I need, I don't need any glory. I don't need any, I don't want any of that. I, it's nice to be recognized, which is cool, right? Um, and you get recognized typically when you do something that people want to talk about. But honestly, my why is because I enjoy, I, I, I don't have to interview everybody that walks into the store, right? I can, I can have somebody else do that, do the interviewing for me, right? Um, but I'm doing it. I'm doing it. It's yeoman's work. Um, I'm spending a lot of time away from my family um, to build something here. There are personal sacrifices that I am making. Um, so that, you know, when I'm done with all of this, that it's something to be proud of and that, you know, my kids can be proud of dad and they can say, Hey, you know, he was a good man who worked hard for us and, and the stuff that he did made a difference in people's lives. Right. I, I hire a lot of young people. And I think that that's one of the more rewarding pieces is that you hire somebody that comes from a trade school or comes in off the street and maybe they've had a bunch of jobs and they've been shuffled around. And if this happens to be the place for them and they feel good here and they're able to achieve more than what they have in the past, we can provide the opportunity. Like I said, it's up to them what they do with it. But I've seen a lot of people, it doesn't matter which business I've run. I've seen a lot of people um, excel and do things that they never thought they were able to do. And it doesn't matter who it is. doesn't matter what the position I got here. And the guy that is my service, that was my service manager. And I walked in, he's the general manager. He runs this business for me. So proud of him. Like he's, you know, he was hostage here and they never let him do anything. And you give somebody a little bit of opportunity, a little bit of freedom. And he runs the business for me now. Um, so that's, that's a really rewarding thing is to see what, watch people do what they do and become what they can become. But 
So it's my why is just to enjoy the process and enjoy bringing people on and 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 seeing them, you know, find success. Um, but at the end of the day, I just want to be able to walk off into the sunset with my wife and kids and say, look back and look at these logos on the wall and say, yeah, you know, we're proud of what we did there. Like we made a difference in people's lives. So. Love it. Mm -hmm. No, and that's, I mean, like that always talks about people brought a price. It comes back to the people, right? That's why we do this. It's, it's impact. Uh, you know, we talked about it at, at our team meeting that we have every Monday. Uh, we had, a, we have an all hands on deck Monday morning meeting. We talked about the amount of people that we feed on a monthly basis. And you know, when we look at, yeah, it's our team and all of their families, but it's also all of our clients and all of their employees and all of their families. And it's, uh, it's a big, big reach and it, it feels great. And now it brings meaning to those minuscule tasks that drive you nuts and are so boring and so laborious when you know that there's a higher impact behind it, it, it makes it a lot easier. There's a lot of responsibility on us, right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, that. I, uh, no, no, keep going. I, I, there's a lot of responsibility on us because we have all these families that rely upon us to make good decisions and to do the right thing. And not all owners or operators do that, right? We have, we have, there's a lot on our plate and, uh, you know, we go to bed thinking about them sometimes and about, you know, how they need us and how, you know, we, we have to be there to support them. Um, sometimes we have to make really tough decisions for the business, for the betterment of everybody else. So a lot of responsibility and you have to respect it and, and handle it appropriately. Not all owners and operators do that. Mm -hmm. Nope. And it's incredibly difficult too. And when, when you, when you have that too, right. It's, a, and some people don't, and, and even some employees, they think they want it. Um, you know, the best thing you can do for your, your team members, if they think that they want it is to show them, right. Open the door, show them everything, because then they're either going to be an ally when they go and do it. And we're going to rise up together as an industry, or if you don't guess, or, or, I mean, they could say, well, no, I don't actually really want it. And they're going to be an even more bought in, you know, individual to the business. But if you don't do that, then they're going to go out and then they're going to be the truck in the truck that undercuts everybody. And nobody wants that. Right. Yeah. So, so true. Perfect. Well, I think that was a very fun episode. I definitely enjoyed it. I have a page and a half of notes uh, of various different things that are, that are great uh, from today. So uh, thank you again, Lawrence, uh, for coming on and chatting with us. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. Just uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, you know, to reach a few people and and maybe some contractors out there that that might have learned a thing or two, and just you know that that makes it all worth it. So thank you guys. Hundred percent. That's why we do what we do. That's why we bring on great people like you is to be able to share the wisdom with the masses. So, um, perfect. Well, and until next time. Thank you guys. Cheers. Cheers. Well, that's a wrap on another episode of HVAC Success Secrets Revealed. Before you go, two quick things. First off, join our Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash HVAC Revealed. The other thing, if you took one tiny bit of information out of this show, no matter how big, no matter how small, all we ask is for you to introduce this to one person in your contacts list. That's it. That's all. One person. So they too can unleash the ultimate HVAC business. Until next time. Cheers.